Thank you. Thanks for being here. So when I started the show, my goal, of course, was to talk to everyone. But not everyone was still around. And as I got to know you and met people through you, I kept hearing these wonderful stories about this man. And as I heard more and more stories, I got more and more sad that I was never going to meet him. And so we're here to talk about Joe Lewis and talk about his legacy. Because there aren't a whole lot of people that left that big of a mark. So, how, did, how did you first meet Joe? Well, I met Joe in 1968. I had heard about him in Okinawa because I studied at the same school he was at. He was there a year and a half before I had. But I met Joe in 1968 at the USK Grand Nationals in Kansas City, Missouri. I'm working on taking the stance and throwing kicky takes, sparring with guys and, and using techniques. And he comes up and says, where'd you get that stance? And I said, well, I studied in Okinawa. Where? I said, Ezo Shimabuku. When? And I said, 65, 66. Well, I was there 64, 65. And I said, oh, wow. That's great. Shobayashi Shoyuru. And he goes, wow. And we started talking back and forth. And he, I, I said, I did this dance out of necessity because I got a bad right knee. He said, well, I do because my front hand's a very fast back fist and a side kick. And, well, and, and the closer the weapon is to the opponent, the easier it is to throw. And we started going back and forth and had a good time. And, and he was the defending champion. It was a great little story. So I win my round. I win my ring. Uh, uh, Victor Moore wins his ring, mm -hmm. and a guy named Artie Simmons wins his ring, and a guy named Dirk Mosick wins his ring. So there's four of us and Joe Lewis. I fight, I fit, I fight Victor Moore, and I beat Victor. Mm -hmm. And then, and then uh, Victor Moore fights Victor and wins. So there's three of us left plus Joe, me, Artie Simmons, and Victor Moore. But I already beat Victor Moore, so he's done. So I fight Artie Simmons for first place. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm the only one in the whole thing that's not part of the USK at the time. So I'm kicking him. I'm bouncing kicks off his head. I'm kicking you know, No point, no point, no point. He throws a reverse. I said, okay, Rupert, but it hit me right here. Yeah. Point. So I said, well, okay, at least I got second place, and I maybe get a fight Joe. So they announced the fighters are going to fight for the grand championship. First, third, and fourth. And I go, Excuse me, can I ask a question? I really didn't want to, but I wanted to know why. Yeah. I said, how come I get second place and they're going to fight the first place winner and the third and fourth place winner? Well, it's just the way it went. I'm glad. I'm glad because I'll tell you what happened. So, okay, the first match is with Joe Lewis and Dirk Mosey. He beats Dirk Mosey back in the 68, 69. If you got two points, you were the winner. Mm -hmm. There wasn't four, five, six, mm -hmm. tip, you know, just two points was the winner. He beats Dirk in about 30 seconds. I went, Bleh. Then he fights Victor Moore. And Victor Moore comes out there, and Joe had just gotten married. So he's got a wedding band on. And Victor Moore walks up to him and tries to take the wedding band off. Joe pushes him away. Take the wedding band off because I don't want to get hit with that thing. Joe's got really good control. So they start in, they bow in. Victor comes running across her, punches Joe right in the mouth. I mean, it was a good shot. But before Victor could pull his hand back, Joe grabbed him, threw him on the floor, in a perfect forward stance, goes boom, boom, boom. Must have been 35, 40 times. I doubt if it was that many, but it sure seemed like yeah. it. They pulled Joe off. Victor goes over in the corner. This is the funny part. Victor goes over in the corner, picks up a chair, and comes to Joe. I've never chair. heard this story. Oh, yeah. Well, you don't want to. <laughs> and I go, wow, so much for martial arts. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to you know, I'm gonna take chair room, the chair away. But anyway, it got all settled down, and then, then Joe, Joe beat him. And then he fought, he fought Artie Simmons for a grand championship. Artie Simmons is a lightweight. So there was no problem there at all. And that was that was one of the things that Joe did. I went, holy crap, what just happened? And I'm working out with Glenn Keeney at the time in Anderson, Indiana. 
We go back to the school, and there's a big sign on the front window that says, Joe Lewis is tough. Because he, I mean, he beat you. And I, so I, but I was glad I didn't fight him. That was in 68. 69, I went back and did, I won the thing in 69. And then uh, 70, I fought Joe. But uh, Joe's one of those guys, intimidation is, is, is the funniest thing in the world. Mm-hmm. You look at him and say, well, he looks like a nice guy. Cute, handsome. You know, I, I wanted to kiss him. But, you know, I didn't. Anyway, but he stands there and you very formidable foe. If you just look at him, you go, wow. Mm-hmm. Then he does this. And he's got these two knuckles about the size of golf balls. Mm-hmm. And the funny thing is, he hits you with them. But he has absolutely superb control. Mm-hmm. I mean, at the time I told you last night when I was at, when we fought in 1970, I mean, I didn't have a mark on my face. But he <laughs> several times and great control. When did you meet Joe? 1981. <clears throat> um, he had been in Memphis uh, uh, training. And uh, what was the, uh, the guy fight training, fighting for the super heavyweight? Uh, oh, uh, I just had thought of it a second yeah. ago and it escaped me. Black guy. Yeah. Uh, hold on, I tell you. Keep talking, I'll think. Okay. Anyway, so um, I was in uh, uh, a Taekwondo organization that had just broke away from the ATA, mm-hmm. uh, USTF. It was... Um, hit it up by a guy named Jim Botin and Mike Brown. And uh, <clears throat> uh, so anyway, Joe and uh, this uh, Anthony Elmore. Anthony Elmore, yes. I'm so glad I remembered that. Um, one of the guys that Botin had running the USTF at that time was a guy named Mike Brown. Mike knew uh, Anthony Elmore. And uh, uh, Joe had been training with them. And so Anthony and Joe came and, and were the guests at our Taekwondo tournament. This was in 1981, uh, spring of, of 81. And uh, they came in and I got his, uh, still got the board, a broken board from a demo. And I had Anthony's signature and Joe Lewis's signature on it. And then fast forward uh, a year or two, the, uh, there's a guy named Keith Kirk, who's a Paso Root um, a guy in Little Rock. And, uh, <clears throat> at that time, now he's doing Shotokan, but at that time he was doing Paso Root. And uh, Keith was a tough competitor, you know, excellent, excellent martial artist. And uh, I'd, I'd take my students over to his school to spar, and he'd bring his guys over to mine to spar. And he had Joe in for a seminar. And uh, so I went over. I mean, at this time, you know, I'm young, and Joe and Bill, these were the guys that were on the cover of all the magazines. They're doing the movies. They're, you know, I mean, they're the men. Yeah. You know, they're the guys at this at this time. And uh, so it was it was really cool. I went over and I trained with Joe and, and Keith had him in a couple of times. And one day I'm sitting in my gym and I get phone rings, pick it up. It was Joe. Hey, I'm coming through town. You want to do a seminar? Yeah, you know. And, and uh, so he, he, I became a stop on his seminar circuit. And uh, he came through, and uh, he and his wife in the blue van. Oh yeah, you know, they came in several times and and did seminars, and then uh, I lost contact with them for a couple of years, and then uh, uh, Jerry Beasley was doing a camp, uh, RUJKD, Radford University JKD, and uh, I went I went one year, and then the second year I went because Joe was going to be the uh, headliner. We there. It started in 88 where, where it was Joe, Jeff, and I, and Jerry Beasley. The, the JKD camp, or was that oh, no, Karate no, no, Uni- no, That was the university, Karate College. Karate right, College, yeah. yeah. And uh, I got to, uh, <clears throat> it was, this was the JKD camp, okay. separate from the Karate College. And then I went, and Joe recognized me and used me as Suzuki, and, and uh, we we drilled, and I, he basically beat me up all weekend, and then... Uh, I got a call uh, not long after that asking if I would be available to do an all-star karate camp featuring Bill Wallace, Joe Lewis, and Jerry Beasley. But I'd like to be an instructor. Yes, man. And uh, no, Jeff wasn't there at that one. First week? No, uh, no, not at at Tulsa. It was just. Oh, Tulsa, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I understand. And so, (laughs) well, I think I did this. 
Uh, let me check my calendar. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm available. <laughs> so, and then uh, the following year, if I'm not mistaken, that was in uh, 95. And then I started teaching at the Karate College. And I taught, got to teach with uh, Bill and Joe at the Karate College for a dozen years. And, uh, and got more and more involved with both Joe's organization and Bill's organization and went on to become black belts with uh, both of those gentlemen and, and uh, the rest, as they say, is history. You know, I had Joe into my gym numerous times for seminars and then would see him at fights and, you know, he, he uh, emceed or was a guest and, you know, guest at a lot of M early MMA shows and kickboxing events just as, as Bill uh, was and, so I tried to, I chased these, I, I just, like I'm here now because, you know, I just follow these guys around the country every chance I get. And that's, that's kind of a good lead into, I, I don't quite know how to ask this question. When, when I talk to people who spend a lot of time with Joe, they, they use this phrase that they were one of his guys. I've heard a number of people say, you know, it was one of Joe's guys. Joe had his guys. Yes. And it seemed like he just kind of, accumulated people it, it wasn't it seemed very organic well i mean here you have this fantastic human being he was absolutely superb good looking gorgeous hell of a fighter great technician intelligent i mean why not yeah. and uh so and and like like danny said he'd use them so they get notoriety that way and other people would come in and say hey how does Joe do this? Need so hey, would you come in for a seminar? Things like this. So and then uh, Joe and I started doing this seminars together a long, long time ago. And then because it's kind of funny, Joe and I have the same exact system, showing room, show me actually showing room. But his take on it is different than mine. Joe wants to be right here. Mm -hmm. I want to be where you are, because from that he can't reach me. So for him to reach me, he has to cover distance. That gives me the time to get out of there or to maybe counter. Here, I'm beat up, mm -hmm. as he did to everybody. So, yeah, and, and so that, therefore, our philosophies in, in fighting is different. I'm 165 pounds. Who am I going to hurt? Joe, at the time we were fighting, all that, weighed 210. Mm -hmm. Pure muscle. I remember we were working out, you hit him in, you hit him in the ribs, and, and, he, and he goes, you okay? I went, no, it hurts. <laughs> and and I, just tough. And, and, and had a mind that you would not believe. He, he would dissect ideas, dissect techniques, and improve them. He, he basically is the one that taught me the left hook. Really? When you get ready for kickboxing, you know, when you get ready for the full contact. He came and spent, 74, he spent time with me. And I, I'm naturally left-handed. I fight this way still to this day, and he just bring hand up and hook. He had a he had a good left hook. He had a good he had a basically a great ridge hand. Mm. He and Mike Stone were the were the guys that made it very famous, very well known. When did you feel like Joe had kind of? Oh, I'll go back to that word accumulated you. It pulled you in. Uh, when. He invited me uh, when he invited me to come teach mm -hmm. in Tulsa, and uh, it was, you know, Joe wasn't like didn't toss out compliments, <laughs> you know. It was if he said something nice, I remember that was it was not well. <laughs> it was at a, it was at a seminar in uh, High Point, North Carolina. It's a gentleman named Steve Snyder's place, and. Uh, Joe uh, said, you know, there's not a lot of guys that can teach it and can do it. And you and I are a couple that can. I called my dad. Dad, Joe just gave me a compliment. You know, I mean, he, like, did, he didn't mean it. Yeah, I'm sure he didn't. But oh, it made me uh, it made me feel good. Well, for him, after that uh, one camp, that we did a, a kicking drill back and forth. And when Joe got to going fast, he was going fast. And I was redlining. <laughs> But I was doing everything I could. He goes, not too many people can do that with me. I was pretty good. And he walked off. You know, I was like, pretty good. No, should have taped it. Yeah, I should have taped it. And then after that, that's when I got the call 
um, to come. And then he had me coming in to, uh, you know, had Beasley invite me in to teach at the Karate College. And so that was the beginning. Um, I sealed the deal. There was a, a Sparky McDuffie as a boxing coach in West Monroe, Louisiana. And uh, I was went down there. Joe was going to be in Louisiana. He invited me down. And I, I was telling Bill this the other night. Um, I, I went three rounds with Joe. And I had this really thick leather headgear on. And uh, he's wearing 16-ounce gloves. <clears throat> Hands are wrapped, 16-ounce gloves. When I took my headgear off, I looked like I'd been stung by bees. And I had knots all over my head, you know, through the headgear. And here's the thing. The knots weren't on my jaw. My nose was not on my nose, to, to, to uh, Bill's point. I mean, he hit me exactly where he wanted to hit me. And he wanted to see what I was made of. And he would carry me and then he would pressure me. And that's what Joe did. I mean, to get a black belt with Joe, you had to go, the old guys, the, you went three rounds with Joe. And uh, you had to, you know, you had to be able to continue to stand up <laughs> or at least get up. And uh, he wanted to know what you were made of. And, and uh, Joe, you know, I, we laughed, but in the early days with Joe, it was like being jumped into a gang. You know, I mean, it was a, it was an initiation. And, and, I, and I want to speak to that because there's, you know, when, when, when I hear these stories about Joe, from the outside, it doesn't always sound like someone that you wanted to train with. Maybe to get better, maybe skill-wise, sure. Two words. It hurt. Yeah. I, I can only imagine. But there's, there's something about him that is very common when I have these conversations well, that they... Everyone loved him. I understand this. Chuck Norris was superb. Sure. Great fighter. Mike Stone was a superb fighter. People that came before them, that came after them, were absolutely superb. But Joe Lewis primarily put sparring, sport karate, on the map. Hmm. Up to that point, there would be a tournament. They had two or three hundred, four hundred people come to the tournament. They'd fight. The winner, then they'd go home. Then Joe would compete, and everybody come to watch him. Because he did it, not necessarily better, but more effective. You know, you knew that if he hit you, he could have done the damage. Mm -hmm. You knew that if you got a point in on him, he's going to get it back. Like all of us, you know, we want to get even. Sure. And But he was, I mean, in my whole career in point fighting, I had a side kick, a round kick, and a back fist, and hook kick. Joe had primarily a back fist, a side kick, and a reverse punch that would rip your in shreds. He would go to tournaments, and yeah, he would grab your sleeve, hit you with a side kick. You'd go roll across the floor. He'd still have his sleeve in your hand, in his hand. And you go, okay, I guess that's called power. But absolutely, like Danny said, superb control. Knew exactly how to hit you, where to hit you. And uh, when kickboxing started, he was the only one of all of us in the kick, in, in, on the team at the time that knew anything at all about boxing because he worked with Joey Obilo out in Los Angeles. And we're thinking, holy crap, with his karate techniques that he already has, with the boxing technique that he's learning, what are you going to do? And, and he was, you know, absolutely superb. And just, you know, we still think about him. Yeah. Every, day, every every year we get to get together in High Point and we celebrate Joe. And stories, you know, good stories, bad stories, you know. Remember I said, you understand what I'm saying, huh? Yeah. And so little, what's so funny? Little anecdotes that he's, what's so funny, yeah. And that's just show. And, you know, and you remember that and you, and you miss it. Mm -hmm. Exceptionally charismatic. Mm -hmm. And exceptionally curmudgeonous. You know, he was a... Uh, Depended. You never knew what Joe you were going to get. He loved his guys. I mean, just like Bill loves his guys. I mean, we we tend to to gravitate, you know, towards Bill, just like we gravitated towards towards Joe. Sure. And uh, being uh, <clears throat> he, uh, it was just no nonsense. It was interesting. I mean, he, he was a no nonsense kind of guy, if you will, <clears throat> but yet. 
you know, he was a practical joker. He loved to laugh. Um, and uh, you, you knew, like, he was the real deal, right? Just like when you watch Bill, you know, huh, yeah, that's that's real. My uh, my thing was, like, I'm not, I'm not big. I'm never, never going to be a Joe Lewis. But there was a lot of the principles from Joe I was able to learn. And he uh, had a brilliant mind. And he, he, he put things together and he thought about stuff. And up until the day he died, I would get emails from him sometimes two and three o'clock in the morning and it would be video of fights and he would go, okay, at, at 142 in this round, this guy does this and then he does it again at, at 150. And then in the next round, he does it again and then he capitalized on it. On And so he's doing fight analysis and fight breakdowns. I mean, all damn near until the day he died. He was just, he just was thinking about stuff like that. And, uh, you know, I, and I, I tell people, look, I'm, I'm never going to be a Bill Wallace. You know, I don't have that speed. And, and, uh, but what I can do is I can learn Bill's system and, and his option offense and his chambers and his kicking and I, things that I learned from Joe. And I try to be the best Danny Drang I can be. And so people gather around. There's guys that gathered around Joe that tried to do Joe stuff Joe's way. And then there's people that gathered around him because he would be insightful. I can remember sitting around listening and he, he launched into a, uh, into a, a talk about just out of the blue, we're cutting up talking. And all of a sudden he started talking about the left jab and about axis of rotation and movement. And it was the most, I have lectured that that conversation and talked about that conversation numerous times through my career. But it was like one of those wow moments. Yeah. I mean, his, his the way he was talking about setting up the jab and rotating on this axis or rotating on that axis and throwing it from this position. And I was like, holy shit, that was brilliant. We're at the Battle of Atlanta. Brilliant. We're at the Battle of Atlanta. Very first one, 1970. I'm sitting there, Joe's sitting there. Glenn, my friend, Glenn Kenny sitting there. Joe says, I have a question for you. Because it's supposed to be no face contact. So that's a jab. But that's a jab, too. Are you going to call both of them? And Joe Corley is in charge. He goes, uh, uh, could you do that slow? <laughs> well, you know, the jab comes straight out, straight back, right? But also, if you watch Bruce Lee throw a jab, it's out, then curves it. Well, they're both... And, and if you watch Muhammad Ali, he throws a jab and cuts it back, which cuts you to pieces. So you go, and this was 1970. So you go, what did he just do? And, you know, he's in a suit. And it's, you know, you go, wow, and very fast, very quick. So you got to say, wow, and innovative, like Danny said, very innovative. He was the first to do the, the back fist to make it effective. Really? Well, in the short news system, this is the back fist. That doesn't work. Not in a street situation. Beep, beep. Well, if I don't hit the nose, I break my knuckles. And all of a sudden, it's, now it's this. And you go, it's the same, but this is quicker and safer because you're out back. So, and you talk to him and you go, wow. And, and years later, Muhammad Ali does a paper written for him that he said the most important punch he'd ever learned was a jab. Because just like Joe, it kept the big guys away from him and set up everybody else. I mean, one of my favorite combinations is a back to sidekick. Well, Joe had it down to a science. He was fighting uh, David Moon in San Antonio, Texas. Joe went his division, David Moon went his division. They square off. Joe said, bam, bam. And you're, what did you just do? And David Moon was left side forward, point for Joe because he hit him with a psychic. David Moon got, and turns right side forward. So evidently, Joe got his ribs. Good. Bam, bam. And I again got him. This is only about 30 seconds. And now he's like this. <laughs> but the match is over because it's two points, right? And Joe, being jovial Joe, Joe wants to give him a hug, right? And he just, it's okay. And it's okay. This, way, this way he said, yes, he, wouldn't, he, would, he would not extend his elbow. And I went, okay. And you go, wow. 
and and, and it was controlled. Hmm. So you can imagine me trying to put you through the wall, which what, he did several times. What I'm hearing that's interesting, you know, I've, I've heard so many stories about his skill, his skill in the ring, his presence, his charisma. But what I'm hearing from the two of you that maybe is a little new for me is the academic approach that he brought to things. I, I, I didn't, I didn't know that prior to today. Yeah. Well, he, he, we're here and Joe's over here. And, uh, I did, I did several, several, uh, hundreds of seminars with Joe because we were, yeah. we were on the team, but he would, he would get mad at us. We're in, we're in England doing seminars all over England. And if you've ever been to England, Restaurants close at nine o'clock. Well, we did the seminar from seven to nine. I would do 45 minutes. Jeff Smith would do 45 minutes. And Joe would do 45 minutes. Nine o'clock, it's two minutes over. So, and the only thing open at nine o'clock at night is McDonald's. I don't want to eat that chicken. Well, it's that or buy a candy bar someplace. So we go to McDonald's. And I'm very persnickety. I want a quarter hamburger ale, plain, nothing on it. No cheese, nothing. French fries and a Coke, so it's a quarter pounder, hamburger ale meal. Jeff ordered his, it's brand new. Joe ordered his stuff. And it wasn't the right stuff. And I said, well, here, I'll take it back. No, leave it alone. And, and you know, yeah, when he makes up his mind, he makes up his mind. I'm not going to eat that. And he picks up goes over where you guys are sitting and says, I'll eat it over here. What just happened? Why he moved three tables over? What'd we do? Leave me alone. <laughs> and he ate it. And then all of a sudden, he's okay. Comes back and sits down with us. And I go, I turn to Jeff and I go, did what just happen? Just happened? And Jeff goes, so, you know, and, and, that's, and, and like, no, like that last 10 minutes never happened. Mm. That was a curmudgeonous part that I mentioned earlier. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, 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 you know, you, you might say something to be funny. Like, here's the most important part. I've known Joe since 1968. I was there when he died. Never in his life. To me or Danny or anybody, has he ever apologized? It's not in his language. We're at Karate College and love him for it. We're at Karate College. And he, he made real some dumb mistake. And I brought it out. I said, Joe, you either apologize to me or you give me a kiss on the cheek. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, no, no, no. Either a kiss on the cheek or apologize. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Joe, either a kiss on the cheek or a pause. And he kissed me on the cheek. <laughs> and I went, you got to be kidding. <laughs> Joe, and you, you, and like I said, you don't even have to mean it. Just apologize. And he go, I don't know. And they really, I mean, this one of those things. I did it. I take full responsibility for it. And I went, wow. And I'll apologize for turning around too fast. But yeah, it, there are thousands of stories and you know, the, the, the one with, you know, Victor Moore, the one with, uh, with, uh, uh, David Moon in 1971, I, when I got very, very lucky and be, I'm fighting Joe Lewis at the USK Grand Nationals, 1970. I'm throwing everything. If I had a kitchen sink, I would have thrown that at him. The score is zero, zero going into the third round. Nothing's working. So I turned right side forward. I come in, I sweep him. There's a picture of him in Black Rope Magazine. I grab his knee, punch him in the chest as hard as I can. It bounces off. Before I get the fist back, he grabs me and goes, <laughs> and I hear the referee say, point. And I said, yes, it was, <laughs> thinking it's calling his shot. He said, no, yours was first. And I said, you got to be kidding. <laughs> and it's still in the third round. I said, well, now, now I die. And he immediately got the point back. Yeah. And after though I got lucky in the, in the overtime, over, and we're sitting outside talking, bitching and belly aching about how that, I said, you know what, Joe? I'm really tired of this. Because Joe was a wrestler in high school and I wrestled in high school. I said, I'm just going to pick you up 
throw you in the pool. He said, all right, I grab him, pick him up, and I'm carrying him, put a double leg takedown. I pick him up, I'm walking to the pool. He said, wait, 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 wait. I said, what? He says, let me take my stuff. He had white pants on. And I, he said, let me take my stuff out of my pocket. So I said, I shouldn't have. I said, okay. So he laid him down and he takes off. And I went, why did he take off? I turn around. There's two Indiana State policemen walking towards me. This is two o'clock in the morning. And at a Holiday Inn Hotel outside. Uh, Dad, we're with you, man. I said, uh, yes, sir. He says, uh, we've had some complaints about commotions outside here. You need to hold it down a little bit. Sorry, we're, my friend and I were just having a couple discussions. We got, you know, excited. He said, well, hold it down. Okay. I turn around about from here to where the, where the chairs are over there. Joe goes out <laughs> from behind. It. I went, you got to be kidding. <laughs> he went, are they gone? I went, here Joe Lewis, the baddest guy in the world, the baddest guy in the world, hiding so these two Indians doesn't say, calm down. And I went, and I'll tell that story forever, and it's the truth. But then we started talking, I never did get to throw him in the pool. And I would have loved to. I would have loved to. But I mean, Danny's got him. We, I mean, if we sat here and thought, we could take the next five hours and, and tell you about stories that Joe, Joe was part of and you know, he's there and he, he do he'd do something absolutely stupid, absolutely stupid. You'd hate him for it. But in about three seconds you would forgive him. Because he was that kind of a guy. And uh, he'd teach something and even if it was wrong, that you thought it was wrong, it worked for him. So how are you gonna say, I won't work? And he, he, aggressive, great defensive fighter, and uh, I mean, very calculating. Sure. And and for two hundred and ten pounds, lightning. For me, my best understanding, I guess, or the best example of my understanding from you of your friendship with him, is the exhibition match. Is that 90, 91? 90. Where, I mean, I've watched it. The two of you beat the tar out of each other, and you were friends on either side. Oh, yeah. Well, there here, aren't a here, lot of people that can do that. Here, here, here's the story. Karen Turner, who lived in Denver, Colorado, set up this exhibition, set up this, this fight for pay-per-view. Mm -hmm. And she said, Bill, would you like to do this thing? I said, I'd love to. He said, she said, because I was still doing the kick in there like that. And I said, love to. He says, she says, will you pick your opponent? And I went, I'll pick, I'll pick Chuck Norris. So I called Chuck and I said, this is, this is in eight, nine. So he's still doing films. And I said, Chuck, we have a great chance for you and I to do an exhibition match on pay-per-view television. We could choreograph this thing to it. It'd be absolutely phenomenal. Better than a force of one. Uh, 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 I love to, Bill, but uh, I'm working on a film. So I said, ah, Ben, your kitties. So I called Benny up. Oh, I've got, I've got to be someplace. I said, okay, I'll call Joe. And Joe says, okay, I'll do it. Now, understand, I'm 165 pounds. He's 210. I said, Joe, please do me a favor. Get down to at least 190 because it's going to look silly the way it is. you know." And uh, he said, oh, okay. He weighed 198 when we did. But... Uh, but it was like, so we, we, we set up a duel. We said, we'll just, we'll just fight. Jokingly, I say, if I get you in trouble, I'll back off. <laughs> and if you get me in trouble, you back off. That's what I meant for. If you get me. Okay, we'll do that. And we went out there. And for seven rounds, we beat the crap out of each other. And it was phenomenal. And, and people to the audience, if you have yeah. not watched this, it's easy to find in you YouTube. Too. Oh, you. Now, here's the funny thing. We were the semi-main event. Because it was an exhibition. People today don't even know who the main event was. Who was the main event on that card? Dennis Alexo and Daryl Hennigan. People don't and Daryl Hennigan after the after the after his win came on a press conference and, and yelled and screamed everything. Why are you guys having these two guys like you know they're they're over here, they're old, they're this we were 
46, 47 years old. Well, let those right. Well, I'm the head guy. But nobody cared about you. <laughs> they cared about us. And, and we had a blast. And we did interviews afterwards and had a blast. And, and uh, we both had black eyes. And, and, the, and the, the, the chairman of the, uh, the boxing commission comes into our room afterwards, starts screaming and hollering at us. That was no exhibition. You guys were hitting each other. That was you. You'll never fight again. I said, hold on, whoa, whoa. That's the way we spar. You know, if I hit you too hard, I back off. You hit me too hard, you back off. It's not like, you know, we have no eagles. We're going, we're done with the eagle part. And it, we had a blast and loved it. And, you know, and I've done seminars before where it says, you know, hey, I've thrown the best shots I've ever thrown him and nothing worked. Bounced off. Mm -hmm. And and I, the way I fight, I get out of the way. So if he's got a, you, you know what he get with those things? No, even in a glove, they were still sticking out, mm -hmm. look like, you know. And so we had a blast. And, and understand, this happened in 1990. People still look at it. That's what, 30, 34 years ago. And we had a blast, had an absolute blast. Did you have any experiences like that with Joe, with him being able to turn it off and on with oh, you? Of course. Um, like I said, from, from sparring with him to uh, going to his conferences, you know, the uh, Joe Lewis Fighting Systems conferences, um, teaching with him at, at camps, being his <laughs> Is being a Zuki, you know, and you could tell the guys that had worked with Joe because you'd stand up in front of them and then he would lock everything down because he was fixing to smack you, you know. I mean, boom. I, uh, I came out after a, a seminar we were doing in Wilmington, uh, Wilmington, North Carolina at John Maynard School, and I had this prints on my rib cage, you know, and that's just from. I was just standing there as he's teaching class, you know. He, uh, but he, he'd call the guys out that he knew he could work with. I mean, and, and uh, just I learned, uh, I learned a lot about running seminars from him. How he would talk, control, you know, because people would anticipate and, and do weird stuff in the site. So he he would put his hand like you know he'd be talking and he'd have his hand on your hand. He go, and I, I asked him one time, why do you do that? He goes, because I've had idiots try to hit me, yeah. you know, and it's like, I'm, I'm teaching a seminar. I'm not trying to fight them. And so I, I know if I've got my hand on them, I can, I can, I can snap them over. And I thought, man, I, I don't know if I want to see that level of stupidity, you know, because that would not go well. It happens all the time. Yeah. I used to go a long time ago, not to get off the thing with Joe, but we would do seminars together. And then we now understand I'm 165 pounds. So I'd say, you know, if anybody wants to spar, we can spar for, you know, a minute, minute and a half, two minutes each. So, and I always get somebody, not a, not even a high ranking belt, a brown belt or something like that, think I'm going to clock him. This is where they're going to make a name for themselves. Yeah, the, only, the only name they get is, we, you know, I, I, you know, and you heard them. And it's an old thing. Joe had this. I mean, if there's a chance, when you and I are sparring, the one of us might get hurt. It's gonna be you, because <laughs> you know we're we're getting older, and the, sure. you know, and, you, and and if I'm showing you a technique, or Joe's showing you a technique, he's got to show you that it works. Mm -hmm. So if you try to defend it, make him he'll put it in a little bit harder, a little bit harder, a little bit faster, a little bit stronger, and then you go, Hah! and sometimes that's a wonderful sound. Because you, you, you just prove to him it works. Especially if you're not the one making the sound. Exactly. Yes. But yeah, he, I mean, he's been, think about this, he's been gone 12 years now. And it's still, his name is still prevalent. Yeah. Throughout, throughout sparring, throughout fighting, throughout the martial arts. Because he did something that at that time, nobody had ever done. Right. He put power with the speed. And, and you knew what he was going to do, but you couldn't do anything about it because you know, you'd say, oh, God, here it comes. Bam, and it'd be there. When, when people talk about impact in the martial arts, of course, you know, we, we talk about Bruce Lee, you know, been gone quite a long time and is still the most recognizable yeah. martial artist on the planet, made some significant contributions. 
Chuck Norris, also in that group. But from my outside perspective, Joe belongs in that group for the impact that he made, oh, and yet, oh, 100%. and yet, when you mentioned Bruce Lee, here's what I think is interesting: is that you know the first time Joe trained privately with Bruce Lee, and the first time that Bruce and Bruce asked Joe to train, and the first time he told Bruce no, <laughs> he wasn't interested in training in kung fu, wasn't interested in learning, and then later. Bruce asked him again, and at that time, you know, going back to Joe's intellect, he told me, he goes, you know, at that the second time he asked me, Bruce had gotten more, uh, a little more philosophical and had gone away from his uh, classical Wing Chun and gotten more into, uh, I mean, he was one of the first people to really mix martial arts. I mean, that was, that was uh, Bruce's thing, sure. the Tao Jeet Kune Do. And uh, I said, the second time he asked me, um, because he was getting more into the philosophy stuff, I was more interested. Mm. And so I did. And, uh, and, and Joe pressure tested. I mean, he was out there competing and fighting, and he was the one that was actually pressure testing some of the uh, theories and concepts. So that's uh, – and, and on Joe's black belt certificate, he it listed JKD methodologies. So, uh, it, you know, among the things that you were learning uh, when you were training with uh, training with Joe, his Joe's intellect, you know, he wasn't classically trained. And by that, I mean, he didn't go to university. He didn't go sure. to college. OK, where professors will have you do papers and then they kind of call and they they weed <clears throat> and they and they guide your your academic development. So Joe really didn't have that per se. And, uh, but he was uh, nonetheless brilliant. And well, the falling out the average Bruce, Bruce, probably early, early seventies when he was working with, with Joe, wanted Joe to claim him, Bruce Lee to claim him, as his instructor. Mm. And he said, no, I can't do that. Because his instructor was Isaac from Luke and so forth. And he says, I can't claim you as my instructor. So that was a falling out right there. Bruce, Bruce Lee. Well, why was that important to Bruce? He wanted to have the fighters. And at that time, Joe was it. To be the niche that he had. If Joe's my student, how many of these other people don't want to claim me as their, student, as their instructor? And, you know, and we have, you know, my instructor to this day still is Yoshimi Muku. I have worked with tons of, I worked with Kong Ri. You know, I can't say he wasn't because he taught me stuff. Sure. So you can't. And what we do is at the, at, at the drop of a hat, we'll say, oh, he taught me how to do this. We're asking, he didn't. You know, my boxing trainers, I, I had a boxing trainer right off the bat named Joy Hadley. His job for him was to beat the crap out of me every day for about a month. Not teach me anything, but just beat the crap out of me. And finally, I go, you know, it's starting to hurt. So I, he said, well, I want you to go to Bevo Covington, who was my boxing coach. And he let me stand sideways because when Joy had to do this, mm -hmm. you know, which is the jab, and the crunch, and one of those. But Joy, Bevo had me turn sideways so I could use the jab and the hook. Mm -hmm. So I said, now I like it. Up to that point, I didn't like it. But then I started using it. So Joe's got that same personality. Uh, if it works for me, I'm liking it. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't, maybe I can change it a little bit. Maybe I can make it work somehow. But I still like my stuff. And, and if you think about it, According to Bob Wall, according to Chuck Norris, Bruce never competed, never fought. Great choreography, great movement. He learned his kicking techniques from Jun Ri. Because in the Wing Chun system, there are very few kicks are to the knee, to the groin. Self-defense time. But he learned his kicking techniques from Jun Ri. So which made him in that much more available to the public. 
But Joe still, no, nope, we'll do it my way. Joe was, was uh, Chuck was, Joe was supposed to originally be the bad guy in Bruce Lee's Return of the Dragon. But Joe didn't want to die. In the film. And I think I've heard you say that that was kind of the shot that he had. And yeah, no. yeah, yeah. And then, okay, fine. You know, you won't do this, you won't do this. Hey, if you're an upcoming actor, I lived that there for 20 years. If you're an upcoming actor, there's, should be, because there's thousands of people that do that. You should never say, I won't do that or I won't do this. Fine. Next person, because that's what, because they'll do anything. Right. And, and the stupid thing about it is, I've done 18 films. I did 18 films. I'm a good dyer. I can die with the best of them. Someone's got to do it. And the funny thing is, yeah, in every film. You were dying to be in film. I died to be in film. <laughs> I died after that. But, but, but if you think about it, in every, in, every, in every film, even a love story, there has to be a bad guy. And Joe would have made a great bad guy. I mean, if, if Bob Wall could be a bad guy, Joe would have been a great one. But he didn't want to die. We've only got a couple minutes left, and as you said, we could do hours upon hours on the subject of Joe. But let's let's kind of wrap up. And, and how would you, how do you want the audience to think about Joe? He was the best at that time, because you can't tell before or after. Sure, sure. But at that time, he was the best there was. Everybody used to say my stone was tough. But I heard stories from Bob Wall and Chuck that Joe would spar with with uh, with with uh, Mike Stone, and he'd just play with him. Mike Stone was back in the early '60s, so the techniques that were in the early '60s are different than the late '60s and the '70s. The fighting was different. You know, back in the early '60s, if you had 200 people in a tournament, you had a gigantic success because there weren't that many black belts. When I came back from Okinawa. If you were a second degree black belt, you were a bad dude because there weren't very many. And Taekwondo didn't even happen until 68, 69. There was Tong Sudo, but not Taekwondo. But yeah, he, he just, he'll, he'll, he'll go, I mean, you'll he'll, he'll never forget him because if you've ever met him, you won't forget him. If you're a girl and you met him, you won't forget him. How do you want people to think about Joe? He's an innovator. You know, that uh, Joe wanted everybody to know he was the first world champion in both full contact karate and kickboxing. You know, you had world champions and two different. Yeah. We, we think of them as being the same, but they were different at that time. Sure. And uh, but he was uh, he was an innovator. I mean, he was the predecessor, you know, kind of the, the father of what we consider now to be kickboxing. Um, he. Uh, Definitely was drawing various arts in. He had a wrestling background, just like Bill, um, and uh, was mixing and incorporating boxing and just as, as Bill did, um, but was innovative. I mean, you know, these guys are the guys that were uh, the predecessors to what we now know as MMA. You know, they were, by that time, everybody was very, you did this style. And, and they broke that mold. And they and, and Bill said earlier, which I think is really important, is that they came from the same instructor, but they evolved their, their personal style to be so different. You know, Bill took what, the, what he had and, and developed his techniques. Joe took what he had and he developed his techniques. And uh, you wouldn't know by looking at them that they came from the same school. Not at all. You know, not at all. But... He, he was such a, he was, he was an innovator. He was ahead of his time in, in the things that he did that we now think of as the norm. They weren't, they weren't the norm back then, you know, the same thing with, uh, with when, Bill. When, when Joe started fighting, I don't believe that anybody even knew what a sidekick looked like because they fought in the front stance. So everything was the front kick or rear leg roundhouse kick. When I started competing, they didn't use the front leg for anything. <clears throat> I use a front leg roundhouse kick, right? That's no good. That's no no power, no point. Till you drop somebody. But uh, but Jeff, uh, Joe was he'd be sideways, and all of a sudden, crash. 
And the guy goes, Ugh. and you can't say no point because there's power there because it flew out of the ring. Yeah. And you got okay. And the back fist side, and the back fist, the, the speed was there. You know, uh, I don't think uh, as great as Chuck Norris was, and is to this day, he ever threw a back fist because he fought like this. And you can't just, you got you to do something with it. When Joe started from that, look at the top fighters and the top boxers in the world. Muhammad Ali, Tommy Hearns, Sugar Ray Leonard, uh, Floyd Mayweather. They all threw the jab from down here. Not from here, but from down here. And that's, and that's where he threw it from. And you couldn't even see it. I tried. <laughs> that's why I ran from it. <clears throat> uh, gentlemen, thank you. I appreciate this, and you know, no amount of time would really do Joe's legacy justice. Look, look Joe up. YouTube fights, Facebook, fantastic person. There's plenty of stuff out there, and, and I was remiss at the beginning for not acknowledging, and thank you, Terry, for yeah. letting us do this here at Martial Arts Symposium, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. I've been looking forward to this. Appreciate it. Remember, when I make yourself clear, you understand what I'm saying? What's so funny? <laughs> you got to do this, though. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Cool. Now I get to go.